It's time for the big conversations, telling stories of movers and shakers, of industry giants and daring professionals. It's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life, the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward. If you don't know where these conversations are found, we are sending you a GPS. But if you're listening to this voice right now, you are here. Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. Welcome to uh, another exciting edition of the Growth Podcast. So glad you could join us for another interesting conversation. We had one the last time that um, the podcast was out. Um, and we are continuing with those insightful conversations um, this week. I have um, a guest I'm excited about because I know that uh, there is so much to talk about. Um, she's authored this book. Um, I'm hoping you're not seeing it for the first time. The um, title of the book is Make Your Marriage Work. Um, so if you're married, I'm assuming this is a must-have. Um, I'll ask her if this is meant for those who are going through a rough marriage or is for those who want to avoid going through a divorce. Um, sometimes people think that because everything is going on well in their marriage, why should I read a book about marriage? So she will give us insights on that. But beyond just authoring um, books, she's done so much. She'll give us um, a bit more detail about herself. She um, is Busola Martins uh, from New Zealand, um, originally from Nigeria, but she's from New Zealand. Um, hasn't been to Africa in 20 years, and she chose Zambia. Um, and she chose to come on the podcast, you know, so it's good to have you. How have you been? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, how is New Zealand? Um, great, beautiful, peaceful. You would love it. You should come visit. Yeah, you should invite me. I'll, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> I uh, so we, we always start with some icebreaker questions. I've got these cards. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to pick four of them. Um, each card has a question. So pick the card, read out the question, and then give us a response. You can just pick them at random. You don't have to see the questions before. I just pick at random. <laughs> what failure do you feel embarrassed to talk about? Mm. Having a crush on somebody else while I was married. Okay. But I don't feel embarrassed really to talk about it because I told my husband, I said to him, I feel attracted to that person. You need to protect me. So, yeah. We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's card number one. Number two? Number two. Okay, let's go for this third card from down the bottom. Okay. What piece of advice would you give your younger self if you could? Mm. Don't stop acting or singing. Because I started singing at eight, and I was on TV by, I think, eight as well. But then I stopped because my family felt I should, or some people felt I should be in the sciences. And, of course, I was very brilliant. I was good in sciences, but my natural self was in the arts. I discovered that. I went back into arts at about more than 20 years later, or more than 25 years later. But, you know, if I had continued with that momentum, I would have grown differently compared to when I started later on. So, so my advice to my younger self, don't stop acting or singing. All right. <laughs> Cut number three. Uh, describe a time when you believed giving up was the right thing to do, but regretted it in hindsight. Hmm. The funny thing is I never give up. I can't think of a time, really. What keeps you going? I just believe I have, an, I have a possibility mindset. So I, I don't see impossibilities at all. Great. And the last one? This gray one. <laughs> Aha! What's your secret success strategy? Um, ideation is one of my top strengths. I have lots of ideas. So I usually come up with options. So even if I get stuck on this one, I will try on that one, try on that one until there's success. So I don't get stuck. That's me. 
That's my success strategy. Have options, multiple options. Great. Um, that's it for the four questions. Um, Thank you. It's a great introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm obviously coming back to the crash part. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. But, but how would you introduce yourself to people who don't know who Busola um, Martins is? Um, I would say I'm Busola Martins. I help you grow regardless of where you are. I help you turn pain to gold, not just pain to gain, no. I go past gain and go to gold. That's me. Okay, so you are like a growth coach. Yeah, I call myself a growth agent. Ah, okay. And, 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 and from your experience with, with people, why do you think it's hard for most people to grow? Um, put it in the hard work. That's, that's the thing. It's like going to the gym and you go day one, you feel very motivated. And then day two, you're like, ah, oh, it's all right. And then by day three, you start feeling the pains and the cramps all over the body. And you're just like, I'm going to take one day off. And then one day turns to two days and then three days. And so it's about putting in the hard work. People find it challenging to be persistent and in putting in the hard work. That's what I've seen. How do you think I can, I, can, I can turn my life around and live a life of hard work? Because, you know, I think they say hard work looks like it's too much to do. And so people choose the safer option and just don't do it. So I, I'm going to flip it around and actually say it's not actually about hard work. It's about working smart. Um, because you would see somebody driving a 30-ton trailer or truck, you know, and, or, you know, somebody lifting something. That's hard work. But somebody could come with a forklift and lift the same thing. That's working smart. But you arrive at the same goal. So it's about, again, finding the options. I guess um, for us personally, for us Africans, it's about also getting our thinking caps on. We need to think and strategize. And, again, look for what worked last time. What could it be? I see myself as a process improvement specialist as well. That means wherever you're at at the moment, there can always be a better version. So when you see that there's always a better version, you would keep striving to make sure that there's something, a different version. Take iPhone, for example. We've had different versions of iPhone, different versions of Samsung, because somebody thinks it could be better. So again, it's not about really working hard, it's about smart. How can I get from A to B in the shortest possible time? That's working smart. So that's what I think. From your interactions with people as a growth agent, talking to people, understanding what they do, who they are, wh wh where do you see the struggles that people have? Because every person desires to grow, mm -hmm. but not everyone grows. The ones that don't grow, where, is, where are the problems mostly? One major thing is pain. The pain of growth limits a lot of people. And say, for example, when I do my counseling sessions for marriage, we see two different people coming from two different backgrounds. Oh, I love you, I love you. We're going to get married. Let's get married. And then one month, two months. And then they start having rifts among themselves. They're like, what happened? We were having sweet times, five years in courtship. Now two months, we're falling apart. What's the problem? So the pain of now coming together to grow as a couple is what's pulling them apart. Now, when they're able to look at the pain as a catalyst for growth, that um, I don't like what you're doing, but I can choose to either learn what you're doing your way, try to look past the mountains that I see, and then adapt myself and accept you the way you are and say, this is this person. I can't change this person. I'm going to accept this person and love this person the way they are because I've also got differences from them. I want them to ex accept me the way I am. When we come to that stage, then we grow. But what I find is that a lot of people do not want to put in that hard work, for example, that I've given that case study in marriage, People don't want to put in that hard work to say, okay, I will look past that shortcoming. I'm going to learn about that person. For example, when I got married and we had a lot of tough times, I actually started reading psychology. I started trying to understand my husband's background. I started researching about trauma. Why was it the way he was? 
And of course, I have my own background stories as well. So, but I took time to do that. And then I implemented some therapy sessions for myself. I did not need to see a therapist. So that's, that's, that's what happens in growth. There's pain. It's an energy. I call it an energy. I don't know if other people call it an energy, but I believe pain is an energy. And the energy either sinks you, floats you, or drowns you. When I choose to let or permit my pain to float me, then it floats me towards growth. But when I sink to that position of I'm stuck, I can't get out of here, this is not possible, there's no solution anywhere else, then I sink and drown in the pain. Okay. What, what, what would you say is the greatest pain you've had to endure? Mm, I've had a couple. The greatest. Mm, I would say when I lost my womb at 28 due to a pregnancy complication. You want the story? <laughs> yeah, um, please, please feel free. Um, so we used to live in Germany and then we moved to China for a bit and then to New Zealand. When I was in China, I realized that I was pregnant and then I was bleeding profusely. Um, sometimes I would use like six to, sanitary, uh, six to eight sanitary towels in a day, which is really a lot, even for people that are not pregnant. Um, we went to the hospitals, but because we couldn't speak the language, it was a little bit difficult for us. We moved to New Zealand. We had a permanent resident. Now, when I got to New Zealand, the doctor, one of the doctors looked at me and said, Busola, you would bleed so much that you might die. There was no family. We were new in the country, and I had a little boy. So the shock of, like, I'm in a new culture, no friends, no family, just me and my husband and our little son, and then somebody tells me I'm going to die. So they said, well, we'll try our best and see what happens. Long story short, thankfully the baby survived, mom survived, but then because they couldn't do some things with separating the placenta and stuff, they had to yank my womb out. Now, as an African woman, that's like, oh my goodness, you are empty because you don't have a womb, right? So for 10 years, I couldn't talk to anyone about it. Maybe my husband, of course, knew about it, but I was just like, oh my goodness, what is this? I'm empty. I'm, I'm of no good. You know, kind of those sort of thoughts coming to you. But 10 years later, I found myself on TV during a TV interview. I just discovered I could talk about it because they were interviewing me about one of my songs, Broken But Whole. And the lady was asking me the story behind the song. So I began to relieve some of the traumas I've been through. And voila, I was like, wow, I could talk about it. And that was like a sign to me that my healing was complete or near completion. Because when you can talk about your trauma or your pain, then it's a signal to your healing. So that's, that's a big one for me. Wow. Um, people who've been through trauma, maybe like yourself, um, others may not be as bad, others may be worse. Um, it sort of like affects their future relationships, you know. Um, especially people who've maybe been through bad relationships, you, they then tend to project that on other people that they meet and assume that that's how they're going to be treated and whatnot. And so most people just choose to be with themselves. They feel that they are their best company. How do those then begin to break free from such kind of traumatic experiences from their past? Um, I wouldn't blame them. I remember at some point I started blaming my husband. I said, you got me pregnant. You're, you're at fault for, for all of this, you know, because I felt if you hadn't got me pregnant, then we wouldn't be. But come on, that's just stupid, right? Because uh, people want to get pregnant and if pregnancy happens, it happens. But, you know, so my, my take on that is um, everyone is different. For me, for example, I took my pain, the energy from my pain. I was in church. I was serving in church, volunteering during those years. I went back to uni. I went back to a diploma in business. I did my postgrad in business. I did my master's in arts management. I wrote songs and started recording my songs. I was working full time. I had a business that grew massively 
So I was busy. I turned my pain, the energy, into productivity for myself. And not just for myself, for others. I was organizing programs for young people. I organized African Praise Night, a music event, over and over again. I was helping young people. They were in trouble. So um, getting caught in pain is a kind of trauma again. It becomes more like complex trauma because that's another layer of, of pain on top of pain because then you're isolated from everybody else and you see every you see your, there's this victim mentality and there's this oh they don't like me I can't get help I can I'm caught up here so I wouldn't blame such people but again I would say those people need to open up and help themselves because I believe your pain is a calling to something bigger Pain is um, more like a digger, helps you to dig deep into who you really are, helps you to discover and uncover a lot of things about yourself. Like I discovered that I, I could write songs, I could sing beautifully, I could do a lot of things, coordinate events extensively. I had lots of capacity. So, but if people are caught in that web of pain, um, my advice would be try and talk to somebody, somebody trustworthy. If you think you can find that person, talk to them. I do quite a bit of trauma coaching as well. Um, like um, I remember there was this guy that was talking to me about how his mom told him when he was little, before 10, said to him, don't take sweets from, because there's this lady that usually give them sweets, and then he went to ask for sweets, and the mom was like, why are you taking sweets? He got scolded, and from that day, he stopped asking for help. 21 years or so later, he came to my coaching session asking for help because he was stuck in that mindset that I can't ask for help. I shouldn't ask for people to help me. So, But because he started talking to me in one session, we were able to uncover all of those things. And he went away free just in one session. So sometimes it's just about talking about it to the right person to help uncover and unravel the, the mysteries of pain. All right. Let's talk about marriage. In yeah. today's world, what would you say is the greatest threat to a marriage? Selfishness and pride. That's what I would say. I was actually going to conduct a research or a survey on what people thought about pride and divorce. Because I believe if I think I'm right and I'm not shifting, and you think you're right, you're not shifting, number one, that's selfishness. Number two, it's a form of pride that what I'm thinking or my opinion or my perspective is better than yours. That's it, in my opinion, pride and selfishness. And how do you think that married couples can get around that? Um, if I were to put on my pastoring heart, I would say that um, if you go back to scriptures, I believe the Bible is the best inspirational and motivational book in the world. All of the success principles and inspirational principles, they most of the times you would find them in the Bible. The Bible says, submit to one to another. Husband, submit to wife. Wife, submit to husband. It's not about the man suppressing the woman. It's not about the woman trying to have um, the freedom that she thinks she doesn't have. Of course, you're free. You're not in bondage. Um, so if we submit one to another, we want to have a project What's your idea? What do you think? What's your perspective? Where everyone feels valued. That's the solution in my perspective. But if I think my perspective is the best, and I'm not going to listen to you, then that's a call to disaster. If I accept it day one, day two, day three, ten years, five years, like actually today I was reading um, the news and I saw a couple that had been married for over 40 years, separated. Why? Probably one party had been sucking it up all this while, all this while, and then bang on, they get to the brick, brick wall and they're like, nah, I can't take it anymore. And the marriage breaks down. So it's about submitting to one another. 
communication is sort of like a buzzword in marriage. Like, no, communication is the key. Communication, this communication, that. In a marriage, how do you define communication? And how do you tell that, okay, here there is communication, or here there's a breakdown in communication? Communication is two ways. It's not just about passing the message. It's also about, and actually, I'll say three ways. Passing the message, number one understanding the message number two and then understanding the intent of the sender because you could send me a message and I could feel I understand it this is the way I understand it you sent it as a but I understood it as B that's my understanding now proper and correct communication is actually understanding it the way you intended for it to come to me so that's what I feel proper communication is in marriage. And when we are, so again, check with people, oh, do you understand what I mean? How does that make you feel? Eye contact, holding hands, touching. Um, there's this book about five love languages, you know. What are, what's your spouse's love language? Again, this is not just about married people, because a lot of people go into a marriages without getting prepared for it. So when they get into marriage, like myself, many years ago, they get shocked. They're like, my goodness, what is this? I was expecting something else. I thought it was going to be like Cinderella story. I thought it was going to be like Disney World, but this is something else. I thought it was going to be, we're going to be lovey-dovey forever. So many people are not trained or they're not told what is behind the veil of I do. So instead of coaching and training people in marriage, our efforts should actually be before marriage. What are you walking into? Do you know this person well enough? What are their triggers? How angry do they get? What do they do when they're angry? Do they have mentors? Are they accountable? Those are some of the questions people should actually be asking before walking down the aisle. Talking about openness, you mentioned that you told your husband you had a crush on someone. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to, and, and the reason why I'm interested in that is the level of openness. Um, I feel like you have to have a certain, a partner who's at a certain level of maturity for you to feel comfortable enough to communicate something like that to them. Others will just try and deal with it on their own. But you go to your husband and tell him, look, I've got a crush on that person. I want you to protect me. So um, the foundation of every relationship is important. Our foundation is on Jesus. We're Christians. We're believers. And we got married that way. Um, when everything else falls apart, we resolve to the Bible. That's the basis. And the Bible tells me that I shouldn't lust at somebody else's husband. I shouldn't cast my eyes. I shouldn't want what other people has. Like covetousness, you know, that's another way to put it. So when this, this person was just a friend coming around, they probably might not have any intentions at all. But this was just me being me. And in our relationship, we're open to the extent that we're very vulnerable with one another. And you're very right. It takes a level of maturity. And that's because we've built up like that from the ground up. Again, it comes down to before marriage, what happens. These things do not just happen in marriage. And there are times we're able to work with couples to make these things happen and just adjust a few things in marriage. But most of the times, what happens in marriage starts before marriage. So it did not just start when that incident occurred. It started way before we got married. The level of openness, yeah. What inspired you to write this book, Make Your Marriage Work? Uh, so I used to write lots of um, articles on Facebook and people would comment and they would ask me questions and stuff and I had people asking me can we put this together into a book and blah 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 and all of that. So over time I began to think about it and began to pray about it on what I should do. Eventually I was able to put them into short excerpts and combine them. It's actually very massive. I had to cut down to, to this, to make it sizable in this instance. But um, I'm very passionate about 
relationships. I'm passionate about a lot, a lot of things. I put my everything into what I do. Um, I love people growing in their relationships. I love seeing singles. The book is actually not meant for married people alone. Down the bottom in front, you would see for singles, married, divorced, and separated, because there are a lot of different things for different people in, in the book. So I love to see people thrive and succeed in their relationship. Uh, marriage is not just about today, it's also about tomorrow and the coming generations. And when we have degradations and decay in our homes, the society, the churches will be decayed. That's why we have what we have in our world today. The leaders we see came from families. The CEOs that we see, the, the financial crisis we had in 2008, that all those people came from families. Some women gave birth to them. So whatever we see that's working or not working started from a home, from a family. So if we're able to fix the family, then we can fix the world. Wow, that's interesting. Chapter 20 is titled Help. He does not have a job or income. Uh, well, you're laughing, <laughs> but, but, but this unfortunately is, is the reality on which many marriages begin to crumble. You marry this man, he's got a good job, everything is going well. All of a sudden, he doesn't have his income. Mm -hmm. And the wife now takes responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a strong believer in maturity dictating how people relate to each yeah. other. Yeah. One mature woman, you won't even notice the husband no longer has That's an income. Right. Another woman, <laughs> you know where I'm going, right? Of course. Yeah. How, how do you manage a marriage where the husband is not able to provide? Um, just like you said, maturity, um, knowing that we're a team, we're not individuals. When you took the vows and said, I will be with you forever till death do us part, you're saying we're journeying together. And together does not mean me versus you. It means us. So that means it's just unfortunate that... Um, in many instances, or in some instances, where women have said, this money is ours. We've heard stories where the men ran away with other women with their wives' money. That's just what's unfortunate. And then you see women say, no, nah, it's not our money. It's my money, and I can do whatever I like with it. Again, coming down from stories of failed relationships from other people, even if she's willing, to support the man, the reason she's unable to do so is because of the trickles of stories she has heard. My friend supported her husband, and then the husband fled and ran away to the UK with her money. With, I'm just paraphrasing now. So that's a lot of women. I, I speak for women now. A lot of women will want to support their husbands, but one of the reasons they do not want to is because of these myriads of stories that we hear about this person helped that person, and the guy did not reciprocate. He ran away. So if I do the same, will it work for me? That's the question. Do you think a Proverbs 31 woman is found in today's world? Oh, yeah. I'm a Proverbs 31 woman. I may not be 100% perfect. I strive towards perfection. But yes, by God's grace, my home is standing, not by power not by mind, but by the wisdom written in, written in scriptures. Okay. There are so many Proverbs 31 women today. Okay, we'll keep coming back to the book, but I want us to, to, to talk about something else. As, as, a, as a growth agent, um, mm -hmm. obviously, for someone that's aspiring to grow, change is the only constant. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be willing to, to change and to not just change yourself, but accept the changes in your environment. Yeah. Some people struggle with change. Yeah. How do I have a mindset to accept change and even use it to my advantage? I struggle with change too. In fact, there was a time in one of my places of work where I worked. Um, it was a bank and they would always bring different trainings. That was very early on in my career. They would bring different sorts of training, training on credit card, training on personal loan, training on all sorts. And I was like, oh my goodness, what's all this? We had a system yesterday. Why are you changing it? It's working well. Change is inevitable. What we just need to do is to embrace change and make it work for me. How do I make it work for me? It goes back to strategy and options. 
Now, there are some changes that may not work for people regardless of how they try. Say, for example, a mom that has two little kids, um, the children has to go to kinder care, and the change is that she has to work overnight. There's nobody working to look after her kids, assuming she's a single mom. For that sort of change, it may be painful for her, but she needs to look for something else so that she can keep working to feed her family. Because if those kids are not looked after when she's working, the money she earns, she will be so pained when she sees that the kids have been messed up by some foster guys. So some pain, um, some, sorry, some change you can maximize, grow from, there are others that you can't. But my take is use strategy and options. If we're going to have a change in a business, for example, I usually tell my clients, I say, don't make it just one option. Say we want to grow and we want to grow to, for example, say 100,000 kwacha per week in sales. That means we may need to employ more staff, we may need to produce more items and all of that. And that change will definitely bring some kind of stress on some people, may displease some other people, may make some other people happy. Of course, the shareholders will be happy because there's more money coming in. So it's a plus and minus. So what I usually say is that to your board, when you go to your board, this is the change we want to do. We have option do nothing. If we don't do anything, what happens? Option two. If we take step A, B, C, this is what happens. Option three, if we do A, B, C, D, E, F, this is what happens. Weigh the outcomes and select what is most appropriate for you. So that's not only applicable to organizations, it's, only, it's also a, applicable to individuals. Weigh your options. Option do nothing. If I were to go to uni now, option do nothing, that means I'm going to be doing the same job for the next 20 years. Option two, Take a diploma, study for two years, spend some money. Maybe I'll be able to become a middle manager. And then option three, take a degree course, which is like four years. I'll spend more money. I would not have income for four years. But then the long-term effect of that is more positive for me and my children and my family and my connections in the long run. So that's how I approach change. And that's what I say to my clients. Okay. Um, how do you know that it's time to make a change, for example? You, you've brought in the issue of, um, of, of organizations. For an individual, for example, who's in a job, how do I know now is the time for me to make the change? Because sometimes, again, people become too comfortable. You know, I've been in a job 10 years. This feels like normal. Any other job would really feel like I'm, you know, stretching out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. How do I know that I think now it's time for change. What are the telltale signs that, you know, change is inevitable? Um, first of all, when you are platooed, when you're like, at that point, you're just stuck. It's like, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? Am I fulfilling purpose? Or am I just doing this for the paycheck? So if I'm just doing it for the paycheck, I don't have motivation to get up in the morning. I'm not excited to go to work. That's a signal that mm, something is wrong because going to work is more than the paycheck. Going to work should give you energy. It should be like when you put fish in water, how it's the, the fine knees of swimming in water. That's how work should be. When work becomes stressful, when work becomes tedious, when work becomes a chore, um, an endurance rather than an enjoyment, then it's time for change. Either you move up in your, in that, in, from that level you're at, or you change your role, or actually move out of that organization, or you may need to change the line of work that you do. I think off the top of my head from research, humans change their line of work at least two to three times in their lifetime. So be open to the fact that you may need to, if you're an engineer, for example, you don't have to stay an engineer all your life. If it's necessary, embrace the change and transition to something else. Okay. And there are a lot of uncertainties, you know, that people face. 
Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you are in this organization, you're not sure if you have to be there tomorrow, if you're going to be in a job, out of a job. Sometimes you find you are in this organization, they've merged, you know, so you don't know whether your job is still relevant or they will declare you redundant. That is change in the workplace. There also is change, for example, uncertainties in the business environment. Yeah. Like here in Zambia, we have challenges with, you know, the exchange rate volatility. It goes up, it comes down. For someone in business, it becomes difficult yeah. to plan. How do you manage uncertainties where you don't know what tomorrow looks like? I have always had, well, not always, but very early on in my career, I, I have always had side businesses. When I finished high school, the very next day I started working. I was teaching. When I was in tertiary in Nigeria, there was a time I was teaching in four places and I was studying full time. Regardless of the uncertainties, I said it before, that I don't see impossibilities. I believe in people owning and having their businesses. Everyone has a talent. Everyone has something to sell. You wouldn't be so concerned or so worried if Things are messed up in your place of work if you had something else you were doing. Of course, employers sometimes are worried when you have side businesses because it may mean that you're not 100% committed to them, but that's not always true. You need to be committed to where your main income is, but the strategy to overcome worries and anxiety of instability, especially when it comes to when you're in paid employment, is to have something else on the on the side. I actually um, believe very strongly. People may not be able to achieve this quite easily. The easiest way to have to become financially free is to have at least five to seven streams of income. When you have one source of income, then you're in big, you're, you're in trouble, because if that stops, you have nothing else to fall back on. That's why I always campaign for. Apart from your paid employment, have a business. Even if you have a business, have another business and then grow into another business, not in the same industry, in different industries. If you have in real estate, if you have in tourism, if you have in manufacturing, just grow your portfolio one step at a time. That's how I believe people should manage their, the instability that we have. And it's going to continue. It's always been and it will continue to be. It would get worse, actually. Okay, you've talked about instability. Now I want to talk about the opposite, which is stability um, and how it relates to growth. Um, because maybe let's start here. Draw the line for us. Growth and stability. How do they work together in one person? Because the fact that I'm growing means it's not there's some shift happening. But how do I still grow and maintain stability? So when growth is happening, it's change, right? Yeah. When there's change, there's instability. So it calls for wisdom and strategy. The strategy, again, comes down to, if you, if you do a bit of research, it comes down to having options. Because if you keep going, I want to grow in this area, and I'm just going to focus on that, and that's it. The ripple effects of that growth they will cause a lot of shift here and shift there. But how do we manage that? That's where options come in. If this is not working well, then we take route one. And if that's working well, then we take route two. It takes a bit of practical or practice to understand what I'm saying. Say, for example, when we had crypto boom and everybody was doing crypto and crypto and crypto. When growth came, all of a sudden, because growth will not happen without something shifting, and then we had the some war somewhere, what happened to that? Crypto began to crash. When that crashed, people began to move to somewhere else. They thought something else was going to grow. As you focus on growth in one area, there's shaking in other places. But if you have said, crypto is here, I'm going to do stock exchange, I'm going to go into um, e-commerce and just diversify a little bit, I believe that would maintain the stability as you grow. Okay. For me, for example, let me just quickly say this. I remember when I had a, um, an event business. And my business was growing. So what I did was that my income from my business, I was reinvesting it into that business. I wasn't spending it. I had my full-time job. The income, the profit from the business was coming in. And then I just kept on reinvesting. If I had eaten all of that, say, for example, 
when COVID came and everything stalled in the event industry, then there would have been a per permanent shutdown on my job, on my business, no income. So I believe when growth is happening, it's about strategy. From that business, I diversified into other things. I diversified into my music. I diversified into other events. I did a few other things growing that. So even when that shut down, there were still opportunities to do other things. So don't put all your eggs in one basket. Keep so we've established that you are a growth agent, but you're also a, a, a business coach. Mm -hmm. um, as a business coach, how do you help entrepreneurs navigate the business environment? Because for someone who's not in business, when someone describes the business environment for you, you think, you know what, let me just stay in employment. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, there's a lot of risk in entrepreneurship, especially when you start off as um, a sole trader, because all the risk is on you. Even if you set up a company and you are the sole director, um, I'm a strengths coach as well. So what I do is I run people through assessments to help them find their strengths. And then I pick their strengths. If we focus on the, on the top five strengths, for example, I go, okay, these are your top five strengths. That means you can't do everything by yourself. You need to delegate, you need helpers. So say you need a, a website designer, don't think you can do it by yourself, delegate. If you need somebody to help you market or design your flyers or your business cards, try one of the traps of entrepreneur, um, I would say new startups fall into is trying to do it all by themselves. And when you try to do it all by yourself, your effectiveness is reduced. The focus is minimized, is reduced. Rather than focus on all the things you have to do, why not focus on, I am good at communicating, so I'm gonna go out there and communicate to people about my business. I am good at marketing, I am going to do that. I am good at strategy, I'm gonna design my strategy for my business. So let's say those are my top five strengths, for example. I will not try to be the, say for example, the, um, board secretary at the same time. I would not try to be the accountant for my business at the same time. That's one uh, main thing I see that a lot of entrepreneurs do that is uh, a downside for their businesses. Now, the other thing that I see that entrepreneurs also do is that they run into businesses thinking, oh, AI is the next thing now, let's do it, without proper research, without proper feasibility study without knowing what could happen, what may not happen. What is the, um, is, it, is it an easy, is it a market that you can enter into easily? Do you do your PESU research? Do you do your SWOT analysis? Or do you just assume it's working for my brother, so it's gonna work for me. And then they go to the bank or they go to their families, take all this money, put it in, five months later, it's a failure. So do your research properly. If you need to hire a researcher, do that. If you need to hire somebody to do the market feasibility, do that before venturing into business. What happens when you go into a business and six months down the line you realize it's not the one for me and you've already invested money? I'm gonna put it on the person if it's my client. Um, I will empathize with my client and say, hey, I'm sorry, this has happened. Um, there are options where you can sell the assets of that business and then re-strategize to find what the strengths of that person can actually carry. And when I say the strengths, I mean what the person does with so much ease that if you woke them up from the sleep, they could easily do it without thinking. That's the core of that person. It's usually easy and best to focus and work from what works for you with ease rather than trying. What happens is this. A lot of us try to focus on our weaknesses. We try to grow. Say your weakness is here. Your strength is here. If you try to grow your weakness and you grow it by 10, it's going to be here. Say your, your strength is already on 10. If you put the same amount of effort from 10 to 10, that's 20. So instead of focusing on building your weakness, build strengths. So for that person who's had a failed business, why did you have a failed business? 
What are you good at? What can you do? That doesn't mean you're a failure. I've done businesses that I've failed in, but that doesn't mean I'm a failure. It just means that something was not in alignment. So I need to find what I'm in alignment with. I can sing, I can write, I can coach, I can strategize. I'm good at corporate governance. I've done it for 15 years or more. So why don't I focus on that? Rather than trying to focus on importing cars from Japan, which was what I did as well. Okay. And, and, and there's this thing people have, you know, where this business is working well for Busola. I think I can also do it. You know, I've seen Busola. She's been doing this business three months. She's already bought a car. I think this is the one. And so people, without doing their research, go into that business. Um, then others realize it's not as rosy as it looks. No. Um, and so now they're learning, learning lessons in hindsight. And so they begin to struggle. How do I identify a business that will work for me and not for the other person? I would say, come and do a strengths assessment first. Look, if I were to put on my pastor in heart, Jesus said, who would want to build a tower and would not sit first? That's why I said the Bible is the best inspirational book in the world. Who would want to build a tower that would not first sit and count the costs to see if he has enough to build it? That's what a lot of us don't do. We need to sit. That time to sit, think, and watch. What happens in year one? What happens in year two? How about five years? I was running a workshop for a church not long, not long ago, and I was asking them, what's your five-year goal? What does this church look like two years' time, 12 months from today? That's what people need to do, not just saying, oh, Busola is doing well, I need to jump into it. No, you have no idea the amount of work Busola is doing at the background. So traders um, build a business around themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think I've got two questions around this. One, most people then struggle to delegate to others because you feel like the business is your baby. Yeah, you know, you like started this business. Even if you delegate to someone else, you constantly want to see what they're doing and everything. Um, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine. She runs a, a, a boutique, so she sells suits. And she says, I began the business on my own. I introduced this person to help me sell. But when the customer walks in and this person is talking to the customer, I feel the need to also want to walk there and hear the conversation so that if anything goes wrong, I say something. I, it's hard for you to trust someone else. How do you begin to sort of like win the business so that other people can still participate? And it's still your business, mm -hmm. but you still allow others to still participate in the business and grow it. Because mm -hmm. trusting others... Mm -hmm. Very big problem. Yeah. Um, I understand the feeling or mindset of this is my baby. I nurtured it. I can't let it go. I can't let anyone spoil it or mess it up for me. But um, I think on the flip side of that, if you were to think of the future, again, what is the vision of the business? Where is the business going? If it's going to be just a one-man band, then it's not going to grow beyond you. If you want it to grow beyond where you are, say you're making $10,000 per year before, and you want to go to 30000 and now you have, um, you're going to be having 200 orders in one day. You can't manage that yourself when growth comes. So you need to prepare for growth before growth comes. That's the mindset the soul trader should have. So if that soul trader has that mindset, it would be easy for them to let go because now we've got a vision board where we see five years' time, we're going to 100,000 per year, 300 orders per day. We're going to have 10 staff. That means I need to detach myself. I need to trust others. I need to delegate. I need to train them. So there's training and there's coaching. When you train them, you do not leave them to themselves. You stay alongside, side by side. Okay, this is what to do. Or oh, you miss that. How about you try it this way? And then after a few times, you leave them to do whatever they want to do. Check up on them. Give feedback where necessary. And then there you go. On the flip side, sometimes it's not you. It's your clients. So some businesses are built on personal performance. Okay, you said you do events. 
And you've obviously built a reputation, you know, as an events coordinator. If I am having an event, I'm an organization and I've contracted you to do the event, just seeing Busola around gives me the comfort that everything is okay, you know? Just seeing you run around, talk to this deco person, the flowers, what, what, just, just seeing you there gives me the comfort this event is in safe hands because you are there. Mm -hmm. Even with coaching, you know, we are an organization, we're going through some change, we want to do some cultural change or something, and we want Busola to come and do that for us. Just seeing that, oh, Busola has come, the comfort. Sometimes it's maybe people who are into photography, you know. You're having a wedding, you know this photographer has built a good reputation. You want that person to do the photography. But now the business begins to grow, and Busola can't be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So this side, Busola is there, mm -hmm. but... At the same time, there's other event where you can't be, you can't be in two places at the mm -hmm. same time. How do you then build confidence in your clients that the people I will send are just as good? That I may not be around, but it's just as good. So the, the business is not me. The business is a service. It is us. So when we present our service to you, we. So, for example, when I meet a client, I do not say, I give you, the, I say, we recommend to you, you decide. So when I say, even though I'm the front, I'm the face of the business, it's not just me. But remember that it was you in the beginning. You were a sole trader, but the business is growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as a sole trader, we always see you. We're always used to seeing mm -hmm. you. For five years, it's always you. Okay. Then all of a sudden, oh, it's now we. So now how do you trust the we who've just joined you? So um, I'll give you an example. There was a time I was just, was just one event every week or one event a weekend. There was a time we had four. And I couldn't be in four places. So I had trained people, and I had given them my word. So it depends on how the business is run. For me, for example, I have contracts that are signed with it. So it's not just contract with Busola. This is the contract with the business. This is us, even though I was running as a sole trader at the time. So this is the contract. These are the terms and conditions. You do this, we do that. And we, well, in New Zealand, we run on a contract basis. I have signed the contract, you've paid the deposit, and you've paid the balance. We're going to be on site. That's it. So it's about leaving your word. I believe, maybe, I may be wrong, but maybe in some parts of the world, people have, find a hard time trusting other people. For me, for example, I don't think I have a problem trusting people once I've signed the dotted lines. Like, I've paid, I've signed, I don't care. I can go with one year's time. I know they will deliver. And that's it. That's how I run my business. How, how, how do you tell your client that we... we, we the Because also, it's, it's, it's around consistency on delivery. You know, that whether it's me or it's not me, they will still do it. Especially for those who are... Because you are, you are, you've established yourself for a long time. You know, others have just been around for two years. Um, and in those two years, the first year I was alone. Second year, I've gotten someone who's helping me around, helping me around. Maybe it's that thing where I come with that person, you see me with them. Next time, I'm not there, but you see the person. How do I communicate to you as my client that it's still the same service? We have a brand. You know, we, we, we protect our brand. We protect our reputation. Um, and we have a name. I believe our name is priority to us. There are even instances where we refuse to take on clients once we know that we will not be able to deliver to them or may, once we know that we do not really align, especially when it comes to what we are offering and what they want or if they are overly demanding, so to speak. It's about our brand, our reviews. We've got reviews and reviews and we go, check out our reviews. This is who we are. We're not going to fail you. You can talk to ABCD. We've served this guy, so you can trust us. Usually I say you can go to sleep and we we'll deliver, so I believe. Some, some entrepreneurs um, are afraid of training others. Um, I, I know that's retrogressive, but they're afraid of training others because I'll train you. For example, I'm a hairdresser, right? Um, I do hair very well. <laughs> you know where the question's going, right? <laughs> And then I train the next person and they do it just as well as I do. And then they leave and start their own business and they get my clients and they go with them because they're cheaper. Well, that's the world we live in. Business is a risk. Where if you're so good, even when they leave, you would still have your clients. 
if you're still doing a good job and you're giving value to people, what people really want is value, good value, good quality service. If you're producing good value, it doesn't matter who left. As long as you're doing a good job, people will come back, I believe. And the other thing about it is that if I'm a soul trader, I also learned it from somewhere anyway. So if somebody learned from me, even though it may be painful at that point in time, I learned it from somewhere. They can learn from me too. They've grown. So that's okay. I don't employ people with the mindset of them staying with me forever. That's a slavery mentality. I can't keep them. I actually tell people, I say, if you need references, tell me, I'll give you references for your next employer. So a good employer or a good um, trainer, or whatever you call it, would be looking forward to the success of whoever is working with them and not wanting to keep them forever. Okay. And, and how do you keep a winning mentality even after you face obstacles? Because I feel like as individuals, we're, we're built differently. You can face one obstacle and you just run through it like nothing happened. Mm. I will face the same obstacle and I'll just be stuck there. Yes, I'll move on, but that will continue to hamper my mm. progress. And it, it, it always keeps coming back. No, but you failed. You didn't do that. Very, and others will just, you know, break through it. How, how do I still maintain a winning attitude, no matter how many obstacles I face? Um, when I was little, they used to sing this song that says, winners are not quitters. Uh, quitters never win. Um, there's also this saying that goes, if you lose once or if you fail once, try and try again. Albert Einstein or Thomas Edison had to do the light bulb experiment about 10,000 times. I believe um, it's about giving it another shot. Um, it may not be the same outcome, but you would find another way of getting to, to that same route. It's also about surrounding yourself with the right people. And now when I say people, sometimes it's not actually human beings. It could be books. And books are people, written by people. That's somebody's idea. So if you don't have the right people around you, look for books, read, listen to podcasts. There's a whole lot of things that can help you change your mindset. There's this book by James Allen. I, I usually recommend that book to my clients, most of them, first or second sessions, I would say, Go read this book as a man think it. Because whatever you think of, that's you and that's who you're going to be. If you think you have failed and you're going to be stuck forever, good luck to you. That's where you're going to be. But uh, my job as a coach or consultant for your business is to help you see what's possible, even while you're stuck in the impossibility mindset. So surround yourself with the right things. Have vision boards. You know, create don't just write on your phones. I was talking to one of my clients. She was like, I've got it on my phone. I was like, no way. You can have your vision board on your phone. You need to put it somewhere you can see it easily. Have the pictures of the mansions, of the businesses, of the aircraft you want to buy. You know, just of the schools you want to build. Have them so that you can see them. And that will be your motivation. Those are people too, even though that's not a human being. It's a kind of um, something speaking to you that you can't stop here, you need to keep moving. I like the fact that you mentioned vision boards because it speaks to my next question. Momentum. Um, everybody wants to achieve so much. Um, I will develop a growth plan. 2024 in January, I have my whole vision board. This is what I'm doing. My career, I must be here. Mm -hmm. I must have my master's or set my second master's. I must get promotion this year. And that is my growth plan, mm -hmm. you know. But then along the way, the energy wanes, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll try again next year. How do I stick to a growth plan? How do I stick to being as committed to what is on my vision board as I was the time I was writing it down or sticking it on the wall? Number one is accountability. You need to have an accountability partner. No one succeeds alone. So be intentional. Growth doesn't happen by chance. Things do not happen by chance. People make them happen. So even if I have my plan to be a PhD holder by blah, 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 I need to have somebody and say, hey, look, I want to write my thesis. I want to write my proposal. Can you hold me accountable? Can you be my accountability coach? Can you be my accountability partner? Every two weeks, just check on me. 15 minutes, let, let's have a chat. 
to tell you where I am, where I'm stuck, how far I've gone, where I'm failing, where I'm falling. And sometimes you may need to pay for these things. That's why some people get coaches. If you can't afford to have a coach, get your husband. I remember a while back, I told my kids, I said I wanted to lose weight, excess cages. And I said, hey, whenever you see me eating stuff, come grab it from me. And when I'm eating those junk food, my kids will literally come to me and yank those from my hands. That's accountability. It won't just happen by chance. You must make yourself accountable and then be intentional about it. Write the goals. Now, apart from the vision boards, write them down. If possible, if you can journal, write. When you write, writing does something to the mind. It sort of stamps, imprints something on the memory, even way down to the subconscious, that before you know it, sometimes you're walking in that line, you're like, whoa, how did I get here? Because you wrote it down somewhere. And it's in the subconscious that, oh, I need to go to the market today. That's why we write to-do lists. So that we can, even if you forget, it's somewhere in the subconscious that I need to do this. That's worked for me a lot. In your business, have you ever felt like quitting? Mm, yes. And how do you overcome such thoughts? Ah. <sighs> Sometimes I talk to people, I watch biographies, um, I listen to people like Oprah, sometimes I go and research. I'm not sure if you know the Rothschild family, Rothschild family, I think they're the richest in the world. Nobody knows them. They don't talk about them much. I think the, 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 the big men in that family died recently. Sometimes I just go and research and listen to inspiring stories. And those things will just inspire you from nowhere. You'll be like, whoa, so I can do this. And you know, we've got the University of YouTube. It's free. Mm. You only need data. Once you have data, you, instead of going on Facebook to watch somebody making me laugh, which is okay because you need a little bit of joy and comedy sometimes, but I'd rather go on YouTube and listen to some of these things and let them pump some energy into me. Sometimes I, there was a time I was going to start a business and I was looking for, I would just go on 100 businesses you can start in 2024. And I would just go through them. 500, uh, two, 50 businesses you can start in Africa. And I would just go through them. More like pumping inspiration. Because you know what? Every human being is a resource for success. So those things on YouTube is a large mine of success and resource. So if I go on there, instead of going from point A to B and talking to everybody, in 10 minutes, I have all the information I need. That's one way I get my inspiration. Another way I get my inspiration is I watch comedy a lot, especially when I'm tired. Because when you're tired, you're stressed, your well-being is at the minimum, you can't perform, performance is at low level. So, but when I pump in some energy of comedy into myself, I laugh. The Bible says that joy does good like medicine. So I get some energy before I know it, I'm inspired to start again. You, you mentioned that Jesus is at the center of everything that you do. Um, how do you incorporate faith in, in your coaching methods as you coach your clients? So um, I seek permission, first of all, um, even if my clients are Christians. I don't assume that, oh, because you're a pastor, and then I'm going to incorporate my faith into the coaching session. It's your space. You tell me how you want to run it. So I say to my client, would you like me to pray? Would you like me to incorporate? Because not all clients are Christians. Would you like me to incorporate Christianity into this? And I would say, all of the clients that I've coached that are Christians, none of them have said no. So that's if they are Christians. If they're not Christians, I wouldn't even bother. Sometimes I would say, oh, do you mind if I pray? And if they say, yeah, we can pray, of course. Now, the Bible principles, we would see that most of the principles in the Western world were built on the foundations of the Bible. So if you look at integrity, if you look at accountability, if you look at um, transparency, if you look at taking responsibility, taking ownership, all of these things are in scriptures. And those are the things I bring into 
my coaching sessions. The Bible says, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. So when somebody comes to me with trauma, for example, and pain, I wouldn't laugh at them. Sometimes even when their stories sound a bit sarcastic, a young girl was sharing with me not long ago about how she feels like her mother was having an affair with, this is her mom, this is her mom's best friend. She, her mom was having an affair with her mom's best friend, husband. And the girl was broken. I was, you know, I asked, I had to ask her, I was like, how do you know that she's having an affair? What's your proof? Even though I would be tempted to say, you're lying, that's not correct. I bring that element of empathy into that session. Jesus said, do to others how you would like to be treated. So if it was me, how would I love to be reacted to? What would I like to hear if I'm in pain of that sort? So I bring those sort of elements into it. But there are times it's a bit complex. Say, for example, marriage especially, um, because there are some things you can't provide solution to. If the husband has walked away, even though I can provide you solutions on how you can maximize your potentials, I cannot guarantee that the man will come back. So that's where it becomes tricky in you bringing my faith into it. I cannot say, because I'm praying, 100% your husband is coming back. No. I can only give you hope and reassurance that there's still much more to you beyond marriage. Wow. Um, what would you say has been your greatest success story in your coaching? Um, that guy that, well, a recent one, that um, young man that couldn't ask for help for 21 years because the mom said, don't take lollies. At the end of the session, he was like, yeah, it's okay to ask for help. You know, that's such a sweet relief. And it's such, gives me so much fulfillment to see that somebody that was stuck somewhere in one hour or one and a half hours becomes a brand new person and can see things from a different perspective. Recently, while I was here too, I was talking to a young man who was bitter and angry and pained because of the some of the things that happened to his parents and because he had to change his name as a result of the separation between his parents. Now, his, some of his results and his ID card, all those things, they were, no, they were not matching and he felt stuck, he was angry. And I think in a matter of 10, 15 minutes that I was talking to him, I was able to help him unravel the pain and we took it off layer by layer and layer by layer. And I packaged it to him gave it back to him, presented it to him as an opportunity for growth. If this was you, what would you do differently? Now, this is your father and your mom. That's their life. Don't get caught up there. What would you do if this was you? How would you ensure your children have a better experience? How would you ensure that your children do not experience the same pain? So even though it's painful, we're going to help you move on. And he did say, wow, I have a relief. Thank you so much. But now, how do you transition from that pain to growth? I said to him, now, start thinking about how you can help your children. What your father or your mother did not do for you. What will you do for your kids? That's the growth. What's your favorite chapter in this book? Eating sexual food. What chapter is that? I think it's chapter three. Eating sexual food? Yeah. Why is this your favorite chapter? <laughs> because the world is all about sex and sex and sex. All the advertisements. Even if you were, when I was little, even if you were advertising toothpaste, it would be a man and a woman. Even if I were to advertise these glasses, it would be a man and a woman cuddling up together. We've been, our brains have been messed up to think that sex is everything even from younger ages in the western world is even worse in the context of this book and marriage what what what's the content of this chapter by the book 
<laughs> no, I was saying in that book, I said, um, sex is a kind of food. You know, I can have food and eat like rice, but sex is a kind of food for the body. It's a kind of emotional food. And I said in, in there that um, people eat this food anywhere, anyhow, and with whoever they think they like. But it's much more than that, because according to the Bible, the Bible says drink water from your own cistern. That is, drink water from your own bottle. Your own bottle is your husband or your wife, not from your boyfriend or from your girlfriend. That's scriptures. Now, we've heard of situations where pastors or leaders use sex to intimidate or to just do some, some people rape, some people say, before you're going to get the job, you need to meet me at the hotel and blah, blah, blah. We know that happens quite a bit. They do all these things. Drink water from your own system. If you don't mind, I can read it for you. It's much deeper than that, though. No, we'll get the book. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, um, what five things would you give as advice to young people who are on the path of growth? Of growth. Stick to the plan. It's the same thing as don't give up. Have a vision. Come on. Think beyond today. Think 5, 10, 20 years. When I was younger, I used to say that I was going to be great to the ends of the world. I didn't know I was going to be in New Zealand. That's how many days journey from Nigeria. So stick to the plan. Have a plan. Have a vision. Make it big. Massive. Learn and read. Um, it is often said that if you want to hide anything from a black man, write it in a book. When I came to Zambia, I was crying. I was, we were driving to Livingston and I was literally weeping. I was just like, I wasn't doing it intentionally. It was just too overwhelming for me. There were some things I couldn't look at. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was like, whoa, do our politicians travel overseas? Do they see what's happening elsewhere? I've worked in the politics in New Zealand and Australia, and I've seen what happens there. But it's so sad that home is, it's unfortunate that I've been away for so long, but I was just shocked at what I saw. So yeah. Read, if you're an African, readers are leaders. That's the only way we can grow. Otherwise, we're gonna be stuck forever as Africans and we're gonna be at the bottom of the ladder. But I don't want us to remain like that. I don't even know where to start from with Africa. I don't even know what to do, but I believe we can help. But if we read and we all come to the same table, with a growth mindset and not just a receiving mindset. Grow from where you are. I believe we'll do great things. Thank you very much. For those who would like to get in touch with you, um, where can they find you? People who would like uh, to follow you. I know you're on YouTube. Yeah, I'm on YouTube. <laughs> um, you can find me on Facebook, Busola Martins. Um, you may find a couple of Busola Martins there, but yeah, this is my face. Find this face, <laughs> Busola Martins on Instagram, busola.martins, uh, my website, www.busolamartins.com. And if you want to send me an email, info at busolamartins.com. All right. Thank you very much for coming through. Thanks so um, much. And thank you very much for visiting Zambia. Hoping this is not the last time and that you will come back to our peace-loving nation. Sure. Yeah, we, we, we have had peace for a very long time and oh, so yes. we really hold it very dear it's very tangible yeah. The peace. yeah yeah we've seen what's happened to other countries so we and we're very friendly i think i want to believe we're friendly to people yeah. we yeah we're not very uptight we're very welcoming yeah and yeah. Uh, we look forward to you telling people in new zealand about zambia and all the nice things you find of course <laughs> otherwise thank you very much thanks for having me